Season's greetings, everyone. Welcome to our Vento Notes webinar series. Today, we'll be going through part three in the series, which is monitoring the process and continuously reducing N2O. And we've covered the, in the previous two weeks, parts one and two, which was accounting for and assessing N2O and measuring and reducing N2O, respectively. So I'll be putting up the presentation. And what we'll want to do is uh, before getting into the monitoring the process and and into O, we'll we'll uh, give a quick recap of, recap of what we've been covering in the last couple of weeks. In each part in this series, what we've been doing is essentially covering the different parts in the N2O reduction journey. So in part one, we covered accounting for and assessing. And accounting for, for meaning getting an idea of what the actual emissions are before we go and physically monitor. So traditionally, this has been done using the widely accepted methodologies that are out there using generic emission factors like uh, the IPCC guidelines. But we know this isn't correct because it's not capable of accounting for the site-specific process conditions. And that's what dictates whether we have high or low N2O emissions. So rather than using generic emission factors, we use machine learning to be able to input the site-specific process conditions and be able to predict what the N2O is. And this helps us with this information, we can start to see what sites have the highest emissions and it helps us to begin to screen and prioritize which sites we want to go and measure and reduce N2O first. So once we've done the accounting part, uh, the next step would be in the screening process as well is assessing N2O and identifying what opportunities there are to reduce N2O at the sites that have the highest emissions. Because the sites that have the greatest opportunity and the highest emissions automatically should be uh, making it to the top of the list of sites that we want to go and measure and reduce N2O because we know they have the highest emissions and we know they have the highest opportunities to reduce N2O. So in doing that, we're looking at the risk, we're looking at the process conditions, and we're looking at what can be done <clears throat> to reduce the N2O. Then once we've done that, we're, we would be ready to go and measure and reduce. And tool. And by measuring, we get to verify what the emissions actually are. So we we already should have a good idea of what they are. But now, when we physically measure, which we always want to do, we get to see uh, what the actual emissions are. At the same time, where this gives us data that we can use to train a machine learning model, that we can then use to look at the historical data, to look at seasonal variation. Because we don't need to be measuring for a full year to see what the seasonal variation is. We can use our machine learning to do that and look at the historical data. And we don't want to be measuring for a full year and not be doing anything just to see the seasonal variation and how the emissions might change over the course of the year. Because at this point, doing that is frankly, irresponsible because we're in a climate crisis. We're seeing climate disaster on a frequent basis. 
So if we have the ability to reduce end flow and not contribute to climate change, that's what we should be doing. So if we really wanted to look at the seasonal variability, we can look, use machine learning and look at the historical data. We should, what we should be doing is measuring for a full year after we've reduced to make, make, ensure that we can maintain those reductions. So that's why we want to be measuring, verifying, and but also helping us for the monitoring, which would be next. But then once we're able to measure what the current emissions are, we can then implement the recommended control actions from the opportunities that were identified and measure what the reduction is before and after implementing the uh, recommended control strategies. <clears throat> so we get to measure also, not to see what the current emissions are, but also what the reduction is. And then one, so now once we've measured and reduced our N2O, we need to be monitoring the process. And this is what we're gonna be covering today because once we've reduced n excuse me, the job is not done. One second. We need to be continuously monitoring the process, continuously assessing the risk, continuously be monitoring what the N2O emissions are, because if we see that after reducing the N2O has increased, we want to make sure that we can immediately take action and bring it back down. Because slight changes in the process can, can increase N2O. And if we're not continuously monitoring the process, we can go through a long period without having known that the N2O emissions increased and uh, negating all the progress that we made in terms of reducing N2O. So this is important and this is what we're, we're going to be focusing on in this webinar. So what I've been mentioning in each of these webinars is that what's fundamental to everything that we're doing in terms of N2O is what's happening on a metabolic level, because this is what everything kind of boils down to. Because if we don't have an understanding of why we have N2O emissions, uh, how N2O emissions are caused and what we can do to reduce emissions. We don't have a framework to be able to, to be able to look at the process conditions and any combination of process conditions for any location, whether it's a, a specific site or within the site, a specific reactor or a specific zone within the reactor. We need to be able to look at any combination of process conditions in any location and be able to identify uh, what the N2O emissions are, why we have N2O emissions and what we can do to reduce them. So that's the framework that we built because we have things that impact what happens on a metabolic level and what dictates whether we produce N2O through the various pathways of nitrification and denitrification. But uh, we don't necessarily need to be knowing exactly what's happening on a metabolic level because there are things that we can measure on an operational level that have a direct impact. And if we're paying attention to these parameters, then we can start to control what happens on a metabolic level and start to avoid conditions that result in N2O emissions. And we can also mitigate. So if we're, we see that the conditions are such that 
a lot of N2O is being emitted, we can then optimize um, and adjust the process to then make sure we reduce it. So we've built this framework uh, based on the, the knowledge of the pathways and the influencing factors and the various full scale and lab scale experiments that have reported been reported in the literature. We've looked at the different concentrations or levels of dissolved oxygen, nitrite, uh, things like pH, COD to nitrogen ratio that have resulted in higher and lower N2O emissions and selected these values that, that based on the various studies that we felt were representative of the general conditions. And so we can use AI techniques to mimic the reasoning process that an expert would follow and looking at the data and being and being able to say whether it, the, the system is at high risk or low risk of N2O emissions and can generate a dynamic risk score. So the risk, so is this is knowledge-based AI and that's this is what generates the the risk score and the the risk tells you because we can look at the various factors the various risk factors that are directly linked to the pathways and be able to say using the knowledge based ai why there is risk and what we can do to avoid the risk reduce the risk and re reduce the emissions we're also using machine learning to predict what the actual N2O emissions are. Now, this is a data-driven approach and it's making predictions strictly based on the data. So it is sort of a black box, but because we're coupling it with knowledge-based AI, what that allows us to do is uh, it allows us to see why the predict predicted N2O is going up or going down. And it tells us what we need to, to do to bring it back down. So when we're coupling the knowledge-based AI with the machine learning, we're essentially removing the black box and are providing a, a powerful combination of AI tools to give us the insights that we need to be able to account for our N2O, for assessing, reducing our N2O and monitoring the process. And this is what we're doing in our N2O risk decision support system, which is essentially an all-in-one platform to help you go through the entire N2O reduction journey. And regardless of where you're at in the journey, whether you haven't started and are just starting or whether have started and you've, you've already accounted for your N2O using the generally accepted, the widely accepted methodologies and generic emission factors. So you have a number, but now with the platform, we'll be able to improve on that because you can use the machine learning to get a, a better idea of what the actual emissions are because now you're able to take into account the site-specific process conditions. So if, you, and if, so if you've already accounted for your Entorium, you can still use the platform because it's just gonna help improve that information in terms of emissions from different sites, because that's gonna help you start to screen and prioritize sites. And if you've already been assessing the N2O, so uh, looking at the conditions, you can use the platform to help you do that much more easily. Because we've, like if, if you've already measured as well, um, and now, are trying to make sense of the data, trying to identify trends and correlations. We've I've done this without a tool, and I know it's extremely difficult. And this is knowing from the the pain in trying to do this without a tool is essentially what led to the development of the platform. It's what motivated the development of the platform. So, if you're if you've measured and now you're assessing, you can use the platform to do that, to help you do that much easier. If you've reduced N2O, which as far as, as we know, there's not 
really a lot of people doing that. I think the only water utilities that have actually reduced them to are the ones that we've, we've worked with, except for uh, VCS Denmark, which we have worked with, but uh, previously they had shown how they can reduce N2O in a full-scale pilot of a side stream demonification process and got some really good results there. But in most cases people haven't reduced, but even if they have, then they can use the platform to help them start monitoring, uh, which we'll get into now. But regardless of where you are in the journey, the idea is that the N2O risk DSS can help you elevate your game when it comes to N2O and help you in each part of that journey. So why do we want to be monitoring the process and continuously reducing N2O? And take some notes again, but the main reason which is the obvious reason is because we want to be maintaining our reduction. So if we've reduced N2O, We want to make sure we're maintaining this. And the only way that we can maintain our N2O reductions is if we're monitoring the process in N2O because slight changes in the process can increase N2O. So we need to be keeping an eye, a close eye on the process because there is slight changes that would impact the N2O. We want to be able to see that and be able to act right away. Uh, but we also, we need to monitor the process and be looking at the risk, continuously looking at the risk because we need to know, it's not just a matter of seeing that N2O has increased again after reducing, we need to know what to do when you know what to do to bring it into a back down. So <clears throat> If we're monitoring the process and we're continuously monitoring the risk using the knowledge-based AI, then we'll know what we need to do to bring the end tool back down. And the other part of the monitoring is, is physically monitoring. Again, so if you've gone through an initial physical monitoring period and are not indefinitely physically monitoring into O, we need to go back and monitor to verify what the emissions are. And verify the models, because if we're not indefinitely measuring N2O, phys physically monitoring N2O continuously. You know, we did it for uh, an initial period and we're using the machine learning to monitor the emissions going forward. Then we need to be verifying the emissions and, and the models because it might be that the, the process has changed and the, the model that was trained on the initial data is no longer accurate because the pro it's, it's not able to 
accurately predict into it because the process has gone out of range of what the process was when the model was trained. And when we go back and verify and we see that the model is no longer accurate, then we can use that, that additional data to retrain the model. So the idea would be to, good practice would be to go back uh, two to three times uh, in one year, but not have to measure as long as the initial period. So maybe just one week. And um, and that is eventually may can be reduced over time because eventually you're going to have enough data that the model is going to be more robust and we'll be able to go longer without having to be retrained. The other thing that we do when we're monitoring is we're also monitoring the process, not just for the N2O, but also to see how the process is changing. Because if we see that it's changed significantly enough where we lose confidence in the model that we're using to monitor the N2O, then we can then go to our machine learning model library, which at this point has over 50 models that have been trained on data with various uh, process conditions, various from sites with various process configurations, with various seasonal conditions. So at this point, we're able to cover a lot of the, the various possibilities and process conditions, or at least come close to a lot of different process conditions that we can then match to the process conditions for the specific site that we're monitoring and replace the site-specific machine learning model that was trained on the data for that site with the model from the library until such time we're able to go back and get additional measurements and be able to retrain the model and then start using the site-specific machine learning model again. So this is some, another thing that we do when we're monitoring and, and another reason why it's important to be monitoring because we need to be continuously having confidence in, in what we're predicting if we're not continuously measuring in 2 so that we can accurately or effectively be continuously reducing n because the idea is to not just reduce once and forget about everything and allow the emissions to come back and maybe even increase beyond the initial emissions. The idea is to be continuously making sure that the N2O is being minimized and continuously monitoring the process and continuously uh, reducing N2O. So when we say monitor, we might be wondering what, what we mean in terms of like monitor, what, what are we, what do we want to monitor? So the first thing that we want to be monitoring is monitoring from monitoring the process is the SCADA data. The so this would be like the dissolved oxygen, which is very important. Whatever is available, uh, but realizing that not everything might be available, so ammonia ammonia concentrations, nitrate, MLSS, because MLSS has been shown, uh, changes in the MLSS have been shown how it can help reduce M2L, but it's not really the MLSS itself, it's the impact that MLSS has on some of the primary factors that have a, a direct impact on what happens on a metabolic level and has a direct impact on whether the bacteria are producing M2O or not. It's, but um, it is helpful to be monitoring the MLSS and understanding what impacts it has. And if we have the DO, we continue so we can can continuously be assessing the risk. And we can also see what the ammonia and the nitrate is doing so that when we see if the N2O has gone up, we can make decisions on how we want to implement the recommended control actions to bring it back down 
because there always might be some constraints. We might not be able to follow exactly what's being recommended, but there's tends to always be some compromise where we can still achieve N2O reduction and, and not stray from what the desired process conditions are. So the other thing that we wanna be monitoring is the risk. So now that we have this data, we can be looking at the risk and seeing how the risk is evolving. Uh, if we see that the N2O has gone up, we can look at the risks to really understand why. And then obviously uh, we want to be monitoring, oops, we want to be monitoring the N2O. And again, this is either continuously physically monitoring or continuously virtually monitoring with, with machine learning and essentially using the machine learning as a soft sensor for N2O. So this is what we want to be continuously looking at. Another, so depending on how we're training the model, of course, the SCADA data could also include airflow. Uh, that's also important for calculating emissions, depending on how you're measuring them. Um, uh, the plant flow and other parameters, but these would be, I would say the, the most important. So that's what we mean when we're monitoring. So the idea is that when we have initially trained a machine learning machine learning model, and when we've, we've gone and measured the N2O, physically have measured the N2O, we can use that data to train the model. And just as in previous webinar in part two, we're showing how once we've measured the N2O, we can use a trained machine learning model to look at the historical data, to look at the seasonal variation. We can use the same machine learning model to go look at the N2O going forward for monitoring. And we've shown how following this approach where we've trained a model uh, with one month of data, which is, is what's recommended in terms of measurements, um, we're able to to use that model for several months afterwards to monitor the N2O with uh, fairly good accuracy. And this this will vary from site to site because we've seen some sites where after two months, the model is no longer accurate. Um, but that's okay because we can then replace that model with another model from the library and also plan to go back and get additional measurements to retrain the model. So the idea is that we continuously have the, the I guess, tools to continuously have confidence in the N2O that we're monitoring. So that if we know, if we see that N2O is going up, after we've reduced N2O, we can uh, then know what to do to bring it back down. And it's not just in the one location where you're monitoring, or where you did your physical monitoring, where we can monitor the process in N2O, it's gonna be also in the parallel treatment trains or lanes. And we can use, we can get more out of the measurements that were done in the one location and use the trained machine learning model from that one location to look at the process conditions in the parallel treatment lanes to then monitor what's going on in the par parallel treatment trains. because. We can't assume what's happening in one lane is happening in all the lanes because <clears throat> we've seen it, that slight process conditions in, in no lane is operated exactly the same way. There's always slight differences. And those slight, like, depending on which differences those are, which depending on what slight difference, differences there are, there can be a significant difference in the N2O. So we wanna be monitoring what's going on in the parallel lanes and we can get more out of the measurements and use machine learning to do this because it's not really gonna be feasible to have a sensor in every lane, in every reactor of every lane and every zone of each lane. Uh, is it this, this just not uh, feasible practically uh, from a cost perspective, from a maintenance perspective, but we do, we 
we can get more out of the measurements that we do get and use machine learning to help us in monitoring. So that would be good to go through an example, live example of how we do this in the platform. So I'll stop sharing here. Over the platform. So in terms of the frequency in which we want to be monitoring, the ideal frequency is uh, every week, what you're looking at every week, getting a download of the SCADA data, uploading it to the platform, looking at the risk, looking at the into emissions and seeing if the reductions that you have achieved are being maintained. And if we see that the into has gone up, you can understand why and what needs to happen to bring it back down. Because what you don't want is let a long period go by where you've seen the into when you're now checking, you've seen that the emissions have gone up because we can always be looking at the historical data. And if you see that the emissions have gone up at some point, you don't want that to be too far back in time because that means that your average for the year is gonna be higher. So the more frequent you're, you're looking, the faster you can act and the lower your average emissions over the year are going to be in terms of tracking progress towards net zero. So that's if you're using the offline implementation where you're downloading SCADA data and then uploading it to the uploading it to the platform. But you can also do this in real time to avoid having to do that uh, because we can have data communication through an API and be uh, automatically get, be getting the data to give you the insights on what the risk is looking like what the N2O is looking like and what adjustments you need to be making if we see that the N2O is going up. So this is a data set where the N2O had been reduced and we're now monitoring the process to see if N2O goes up. And this is like a two week period, but again, I think one week is even is better to be doing because even two weeks, is, which wouldn't be bad, you could you could see that in those two weeks the N2O went up. So now you have two weeks of higher N2O emissions. And that's what 14 days out of the 365. So it's not gonna have a huge impact, but it can it can impact it. So you can uh, minimize the impact that increased emissions have and be able to act fast to reduce them again if you see that they go up. Obviously, that's going to be better. So this, this is what the, the risk looked like for that period. So this, this is a period where they had the low N2O after reducing. So we can look at what the, the N2O was. So this was where they were actually monitoring the N2O physically. So this is the measured N2O. And we can see that, yeah, there, there, it was generally lower relatively lower in the beginning after they had reduced, but they did go up. So again, this is a perfect example where if you're not paying attention, you think your N2O is this, but your N2O can quickly change to this. Um, so it's gone up significantly. And if we look at what the DO is, because at this point we're just looking at the, so we can see the, the, the risk, we see more blue than here, and we see more red. The, there was red and there was blue before, but the periods of the blue and the periods of the red were much shorter when the N2O was looking like this. As soon as the, the especially, so the blue is risk of N2O due to low DO conditions, and the red is risk of N2O emissions due to high DO conditions. And you can see they're minimizing these periods where they had high, higher risk. Uh, so they did have peaks 
in the low DO risk and the high DO risk, but they were very short and, and kept to a short period. But as soon as they started extending the period of the high DO risk, you can see, uh, and it allowed into to increase further. So the longer that they're operating under risk, the the more chance you're allowing into to increase. So we can see, and you can see that it, it's it looks like it's on, under both conditions that you see with these peaks. So this peak is underneath this peak of the blue uh, low DO risk, but a lot of these peaks are during times of this high DO risk. So if we look at what the actual deal was, we can see how overall, like in general, like the and, and the deal kind of shifted up, and, and I mean that's why we see that there's more longer periods of this high deal risk, but we also see into a going down more frequently and putting the system at risk due to the, the low DO conditions. Then the other thing that we can do is look at what the DO should have been. So here we see that there's, there's more period, longer periods where the, the blue, the, the gray, the actual DO is above the, the cyan, which is the recommended DO. So you see this above the, the cyan line quite a bit, and we also see more times where it's below. So I think if we're monitoring the process, monitoring the risk is telling us, okay, the n emissions went up because now the n is coming back down, is going, the, the DO is being lowered more, um, putting us at risk of n due to low DO conditions more frequently. And it's also um, increasing the time that we're under high deal risk. Because if we also look at the ammonia, we can see how the ammonia actually kind of came down. So now, because they're increasing the period uh, or the, the they're under high DO risk or the period that they have are higher DO, they are converting more ammonia. And if you're converting ammonia under high risk, the more ammonia you convert under high risk, the more N2O you're going to produce. So this, this explains why this N2O is going higher because they're converting more ammonia under more high risk. And this is a perfect example of how it's not what you have coming out that's gonna tell you whether you have high emissions or low emissions because there is that thinking out there that in, in methodologies that are being suggested that should look at what the effluent nitrogen is or what the nitrogen converted is because generally they think that the, the lower, the more nitrogen you're converting, the better your nitrogen removal process, the lower your N2O emissions are going to be. And that's not necessarily the case. It's not what the actual nitrogen converted is. It's how you convert that nitrogen because you can convert more nitrogen at high risk and have higher N2O emissions. And this, is a perfect example of that. So you can't just look at what's coming in and what's going out. You have to look at what's happening inside the reactor because that's what's going to tell you whether you have high emissions or not. So this is how we use the platform to be monitoring the process to understand, okay, what does the risk look like? What can we do to bring it back down? Because here the, the idea would be that, okay, we were perfectly fine when the ammonia looked like this. So why don't we make the adjustments so that we can get the ammonia looking back like this, we can have le less risk and we can make sure our N2O stays down here. So it's harder to see what the N2O is because 
Now we have ammonia to some higher concentration, so it's harder to see. But we have this uh, normalization tool. So now it normalizes the data. We can see the trends much easier. So we can say that, okay, we were fine when the ammonia looked like this. So let's go back to this where we have our N2O is here and, and not up here. So this is what we want to be doing when we're monitoring the process so that we can continuously be reducing N2O. Okay, stop sharing. Go back to PowerPoint. So that's what the monitoring the process and continuously and, and continuously reducing into a part of the journey looks like. So now we've gone through the whole journey, but since we haven't, we've only been doing the various parts of the journey and each webinar, I thought it'd be good to, to recap and go through the whole journey, get an idea of what the whole journey looks like. Uh, and understand that you, the, to get more details on each, uh, you can go to the recordings of the other webinars uh, to get more details on each part of the journey. But we'll briefly go through that now. And the accounting for and assessing event to again, this was for to be able to see what sites have higher emissions so we can start to prioritize sites. And, and here's an example of where we're able to look at the risk. We're able to look at the predicted N2O emissions are and see where there's opportunities. And the, the sites that have the higher emissions and the greater opportunities to reduce N2O are the sites we want to be going to and measuring first. And this is what we start making a list of the sites based on emissions and opportunities. This helps us to decide on where we can go and measure and reduce N2O first. So in terms of the measurements, we went through the various methods each has their own pros and cons. So depending on what your situation is, uh, you want to select the method that's going to work best for you. And from our perspective, we can leverage data from any of the methods. Um, and depending on what the goals are, what, what your configuration looks like, we'd be happy to give our suggestions in terms of what method might work better and where, where to be measuring. Uh, here's an example of the, the Unisense controller and sensor, which tends to be our go-to method just because it's really easy to set up quickly. Um, it, it can be moved around if we want to be using it to go back and verify emissions at different sites. It's much easier to work with than, say, the, the floating hood method. But again, each method has its pros and cons, and you want to be taking that into consideration. Then once you know how, what you're going to be using to measure, and then you need to be using process knowledge and knowledge of N2O to decide where you want to be measuring, what reference points you want to be looking at um, in terms of continuously monitoring N2O, either physically or uh, virtually with uh, machine learning. But while you're doing the physical measurements, you want to be checking the spatial variation. <clears throat> and also based on the process, if there's um, gradients, you want to be making sure you're getting rep representative measurements of what the N2O emissions uh, can look like. So once you're actually collecting the data, you can then be training the machine learning model to then be looking at the historical data to look at the seasonal, seasonal variation because we don't want to be looking at the, uh, we don't want to be physically measuring for a whole year just to see the seasonal variation. 
we're going to me measure for a full year. We want to reduce N2O and measure the reduced N2O. If we want to see the seasonal variation, we can use the historical data and the machine learning to do that. We have good success doing that with this approach so far. So now once we've measured, we can also go, go and, and verify that the opportunities that we had identified previously still make sense. And uh, we have yet to see a case where the N2O doesn't correspond with the risk. So here we can see the, the measured N2O was corresponding with the risk. And in here it was for both conditions, the low DO condition, but also the high DO condition. We saw increasing N2O under the high DO condition repeatedly. So those told us that the recommendations that we were making in terms of adjusting the DO, because before we saw long periods of where the DO was above where it should have been and long periods where it was below where it should have been. So we wanted them to adjust the DO so that they were closer to the to the blue line. So and then they so they made those adjustments so we can see how they came a lot closer to the blue line and then um, looked at the measured data before and after. And we can see the, the immediate effect of bringing the DO closer to that blue line where they were able to reduce their N2O quite a bit. And this was uh, the case that we showed in the previous webinar for waterboard iron mass in the Netherlands. So now we've reduced our N2O and we wanna make sure we're monitoring the process, the process parameters, the DO, the ammonia, nitrate, MLSS, also the risk. So now that we have that data, we can look at the risk, we can predict N2O, and we can be doing this in all of the treatment lanes because if we see that N2O is going back up, like we saw in the, the live demo example, we know what we can do to bring it back down and we, can, we wanna be able to act uh, quickly. So that's what the whole N2O reduction journey looks like. Uh, it's something that if you haven't started, it can start today. Again, if you have started, then we can use this approach. We can use the N2O risk DSS to help you elevate your game when it comes to N2O. So I want to thank everyone for joining and want to wish everyone a safe and joyous holiday season and all the very best in 2023. Thank you.